Peace be to you. In the last lesson, we spoke about sin in general and said that from the natural point of view, it was a violation of the law of God. Every sin has a triple effect. First of all, it divides a person from himself. Two, from his neighbor, and three, from God. First of all, from himself, because it makes the soul a kind of a battlefield. After a sin, one always feels like a menagerie full of wild beasts. Then sin also alienates a man from his neighbor. A man who cannot live with himself cannot live with his neighbor. That is why Cain, after his sin, asked, Am I my brother's keeper? Finally, it estranges us from God, and gives us a sense of, of loneliness. In some way, we dam up and block up the mind which ought to have communion with God. And the result is that all of the scum and the flotsam and jetsam of life are crowded back upon us. Now, sin is of two kinds. It can be mortal or venial. Here we speak of personal or actual sins. The difference between the two is very easy to understand. We speak of someone receiving a mortal wound in the physical order. Namely, it is one that kills him. If, however, he is not seriously wounded, that would be equivalent to a venial sin. Now, in a mortal sin, and for those who are in the supernatural order, grace is killed. Divine life is extinguished. That is why in the supernatural order, a mortal sin is not just a violation of the law of God, it is a crucifixion. As we read in the epistle of the Hebrews, would they crucify the Son of God a second time? Sin is the second death, because it's the death of divine life. It is very much like a tree being blasted with lightning. And when we fall into mortal sin, we lose all of the merits that we gained before, though we can regain them after a sacramental confession, just like a tree can revive in the springtime after a very hard winter. A venial sin, we said, is one that does not kill the divine life, but just simply wounds it slightly. It is something like the tensions between friends that endanger the friendship, but never completely break it. But really, when one loves, one does not make so much a distinction between mortal and venial sin. It is quite wrong to say, oh, is it a mortal sin? If it is, I will not do it. If it is a venial sin, I will. Really, when you love someone, you never make any distinction between a mortal and venial sin. A husband, for example, does not make any distinction if he loves his wife of slapping her face, giving her a bloody nose, or biting her ear, or slitting her throat. All of them are quite inconceivable to him, simply because he loves her. Coming more precisely to the definition of original sin, in order that there be, or may I mean mortal sin, not original, in order that there be a mortal sin, three conditions must be fulfilled. One, there must be grievous or serious matter. Two, there must be serious and sufficient reflection. And three, there must be full consent of the will. First, there must be grievous apple. Uh, hmm, grievous apple. Grievous matter, 
The reason I said apple was because I was going to use the word apple as an illustration. For example, if you stole an apple from a neighbor's orchard and he had dozens and dozens of trees, that would not be grievous matter. But the grievous matter, you must not think, must always be a sin of commission. It can be a sin of omission, like not going to Mass on Sunday. And second, there must always be sufficient reflection or full advertence to what one is doing. If, for example, you are visiting a neighbor, a friend, and you do sleepwalking, and during the sleep, you break a Ming vase. I say vase because it's very expensive. It were, if it were cheap, we would call it a vase. There's no advertence to that. Therefore, there cannot be a mortal sin. If you eat meat on Friday, thinking it's Thursday, there's no mortal sin. I remember once going into the lunchroom at the Grand Central Station and I said to the waiter that I wanted a hamburger. He said, the hamburger isn't good today. Well, I said, then give me a lamb chop. Oh, he said, I wouldn't recommend the lamb chop either. We're not very proud of these lamb chops. Then it suddenly dawned on me that he was trying to advise me that today was Friday. I had forgotten that it was. If I had been served the meat by someone who was not so kind to me, it would not have been a grievous sin. Then two persons who are suffering from mania and phobias and the like lack full advertence. Finally, there must be full consent of the will. Fear and passion and force can diminish consent. I said diminish, but they do not destroy it. Now, it's not always easy to see whether to know whether or not one has fulfilled these three conditions, and the best way to do it in confession is to confess them as dubious and then ask the priest for his judgment. In mortal sin, therefore, there is a double element, a turning to creatures and also a turning from God. In order to remedy all of the sins and to atone for all of the sins that have been committed since baptism, our blessed Lord has instituted the sacrament of penance. The matter that we submit in that sacrament constitutes our sins, and we submit it to the judgment of the Church. And then there is the other side of the sacrament, which is the words of the priest when he absolves us. He says, De in, do, de in Diego te absolvo peccatis tuis, in nomine patris et fidei et spiritus sancti. Amen. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord, and not the Church, instituted the sacrament. It did not exist in the Old Testament. Though in the Old Testament there was an acknowledgement of sins before God. When Adam had eaten the forbidden fruit, God said to him, Hast thou eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? God knew that he had. Why did he ask? In order to elicit a confession. God said to Cain, Where is thy brother? tried again to elicit a confession from Cain. And by the way, Cain refused to go to confession because he answered, Am I my brother's keeper? Through the Old Testament too, every sinner had to bring a sin offering, which was burned in public as if to publicly admit his guilt. John the Baptist heard the confession of sins. Now all of these were merely types of the sacrament to come.
because forgiveness is possible only through the passion and merits and death of our blessed Lord. Our blessed Lord certainly had the power to forgive sins. And he did. Remember the man who was let down from the roof? The man who was sick of palsy? And our blessed Lord said to him, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And the Pharisees that were standing about said, Who can this be that he talks so blasphemously? Who can forgive sins but God only? They were right. Only God can forgive sins. But how did he do it? He did it through a human nature. Now God can communicate that power to other human natures. If he communicates that power of forgiveness to his church, he conferred it on Peter when he gave him the power of keys. And he said to Peter, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That power that was given to Peter alone is ratified in heaven. But our blessed Lord also gave to Peter and the apostles and extension of that power. Only to Peter were those words said, but to Peter and the apostles after the resurrection, our blessed Lord said, as he breathed on them, as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. When you forgive men's sin, They are forgiven when you hold them bound, they are bound. It is very clear here that our blessed Lord who was saved, that all power was given to him, he now passes on to them. And the very words that he used to Peter and the eleven or to his church implied hearing confessions because if they did not know if they did not hear confessions rather how would they know which sins to forgive and which sins to retain this is possible only because they could make a judgment on the material that was given You may ask, well, why did our Lord institute a confession in the telling of sins? Why shouldn't we bury our head in our handkerchief and tell God we're sorry? Try it with a traffic cop sometime. There's no test of sorrow if you were the judge. Just suppose we did that for every other court in the world. What would happen to justice in our country if all judges and courts and so forth, when they had murderers and thieves and dope addicts before them, handed out Kleenex? Sin is pride. And the telling of it is a humiliation and therefore a reparation for the sin. Furthermore, in the natural order, Does not a hurtful thing hurt more if it is shut up, a boil, a tooth that aches? We lance boils. Why? In order to release the pus. So our Lord said he would lance souls in order to release the evil that was in. And it does not nature also suggest that as soon as the stomach takes into itself any foreign substance, 
something that it cannot assimilate for the general good of the body, it throws it off. The soul, too, has that instinct. It wants to throw off everything that is harmful to it and its destiny. From another point of view, when a sin is avowed, it loses its tenacity. It is seen as it is in all of its horror. If we suppress a sin, and how many are doing that today, it comes out in complexes. There is a normal way for sin to come out, just as there is a very normal way for toothpaste to come out of a tube of toothpaste. Now suppose you keep the cap off and you squeeze and squeeze the tube. Where is the paste going to come out? You do not know. But in any case, it's going to be messy. Now, when we keep the cap on our soul and do not allow what is in us to come out as it normally should, when we suppress guilt, then it begins to come out in a thousand curious ways, and they are all abnormal. God was very merciful in instituting the sacrament. But you may ask, very well, but why should I confess my sins to a priest? Maybe he's not as holy as I am. That could be very true because we hear the confessions of many saints. But though you are holier than the priest, you have not more powers than the priest. You may be a far better citizen than the mayor, but he has powers which you do not have. Our blessed Lord gave the power to his church, did not give it to people. That is why a priest is the authorized minister of the sacrament. And furthermore, it is not the priest who absolves you. A man cannot forgive sins. The priest in the sacrament is only the instrument of Christ. He gives and loans our Lord his voice. It is Christ who forgives and the words of absolution means I, Christ, absolve you from your sins. And furthermore, why be ashamed to confess the sins to the priest? He's bound by what is called the sigillum or the seal of confession because he is only the instrument of our Lord. The sins that he hears are not his own. They are not a part of his knowledge. He merely, in this instance, was the ear of Christ. And he is under the, he may not divulge any sin that you confess, even under the pain of death. Suppose I kept money in a drawer here in my desk, and every day somebody came in and stole some money out of the drawer. Then that person came to confession to me. I could tell that person to return the money because there must always be a, uh, a validation of that which was wrong. But because I learned something in the confessional, namely that that person stole out of my desk, I would never again be allowed to lock the door of that desk. So none of your sins will ever be told. Nor can we even speak to you about them outside of confession. If you, for example, come in and say that you stole money, I could not go up to you afterwards and say, Oh, say, remember you told me about the money that you stole from that pickle factory? Did you ever return it? That information is not mine. It is God's. Then another reason for confessing sins to a priest is this. No sin is individual. It hurts neighbor. And if we belong to the mystical body of Christ, it in some way diminishes the charity of the mystical body of Christ. 
Every sin hurts the church. And because, therefore, every sin in some way involves the mystical body of Christ, it is fitting and becoming that a representative of the mystical body of Christ restore you again to its unity and to its fellowship. In the early church, even the penances were public. in order to indicate that there was in some way and in a very serious way an injury done to the kahal, to the mystical body of Christ, to the church. Now let us come into the actual practice of confession. Before you go into the box, you examine your conscience. And when you examine your conscience, you begin with a prayer to the Holy Spirit to enlighten it. Remember that it is only in the face of God, and in particular before the crucifix, that we discover our true condition. We judge ourselves not by our own standards nor by public opinion, but simply by the standards of God himself. Now you may examine your conscience according to the commandments, which is not always the best way because it reduces our Christian life to cold duties. We're apt to become legalistic and very calculating. We could examine our conscience in the light of virtues and also the light of the seven capital sins. But in any case, we have to examine our sins according to their number, their kind, and their circumstances. This is a story, and it's only, only a story. One day, a group of lumberjacks of Canada came to confession. They had not been to confession in about ten years or more. They all lined outside of the box, one after the other. The first one went in. He had not examined his conscience. So he said to the priest, Father, I've committed every sin a man can commit. The priest asked, Did you ever commit murder? No, he said, I did not. That is one sin I never committed. Well, said the priest, now you go outside of the box and examine your conscience again. The number, the kind, and the circumstances of sin. As he went out of the box, he saw the long line of lumberjacks outside, and he said to them, no use tonight, boys, just hearing murder cases. Then, too, when you confess sins, you never involve any other person. You cannot, for example, say, I was angry, but you ought to know my wife. What a lazy old gossip. Evidently, such a confession would not be sincere. Now we go into the box and begin the confession. As soon as we go in, we kneel down, we bless ourselves and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Then we state how long it has been since our last confession. It has been three weeks, it has been two weeks, it has been a month, it has been a year. It has been any definite period of time. Suppose now we will have someone who has not been to confession in 50 years. Suppose he's 80 years old. Now what kind of a confession can he make? He cannot remember all of the, the number of sins, 
the light. Well, his confession might be something like this. You'll notice how brief it is. Father, it has been 50 years since I last went to confession. During 20 years of my life, I never went to Mass, I never frequented the sacraments, I never made my Easter duty. I did not fast. Many times a day I took in the name of God falsely. I used it falsely. I also took false oaths in court about five times. I was disobedient in a very serious way to civil authorities twice. I assisted at abortion twice. I murdered once. I was an alcoholic for ten years. I had immodest thoughts, certainly every day for about thirty years. Immodest actions with myself many times for about ten years. While living with my first wife, I was guilty of adultery many, many times, certainly over a period of three years. While my first wife was living, I married again. So I lived in adultery for about five years. She is now dead. During this time in business, I cut corners. I underpaid my employees. I thought only about making money. I never gave to any charities, except when I was forced to, out of public shame. I particularly regret once refusing to send a hundred dollars to the Holy Father for the missions of the world, and I had plenty of money. I gave myself over to an excessive spirit of amusement theaters, dinners, parties. I can never recall once in my life ever having helped anyone in distress. I never gave up my evening once to help the church. I completely neglected my wife as regards esteem and affection. I never sent my children to a religious school. I let them do as I please, they pleased. And I became angry at them for their impiety. And now I am suffering from that. For these and all the sins of my past life. Those which I do not remember, but as God sees them, I ask pardon of God.